Good evening, everybody. I want to thank everybody for joining us for another Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're going to uh, continue on. If you remember last week, uh, we started with uh, kind of going over Jeremiah. And as we uh, move forward, um, I said after the, we looked at some of the, the Babylonian captivity of Judah, uh, we said that we were going to look at the next uh, four prophets of that time frame. And so we started with Jeremiah. And tonight we're going to look at uh, uh, the short letters of, uh, uh, of the prophets of uh, Zephaniah, uh, Habakkuk, and Nahum. And so we're going to look at uh, these three. And as we think about uh, Zephaniah, um, and as we go over this, um, he, he taught and he uh, brought the word of God. He brought uh, God's message at the same time that Jeremiah was bringing God's message. The difference was Jeremiah was preaching to very large crowds. He was uh, preaching to uh, uh, the king, the king himself, along with other leaders, in Zephaniah, he was preaching more to uh, smaller crowds, and in, in, the, in these smaller crowds, they were made up of more uh, of the common people of the day, if you will. But the message was still basically the same. Uh, there needs to be repentance and repentance on a grand scale. And so when you look, think about Jeremiah, you think about Zephaniah, they both preached, uh, they both uh, prophesied in about 625 BC. Uh, we know that Zephaniah's book uh, is spoken to, uh, as I said earlier, to more of the common man, uh, where Jeremiah's was, was more towards the leadership. Um, uh, when I think of Zephaniah, his message was more singular in, in the sense that uh, God's judgment is coming. And when you look at that message that God's judgment is coming, you would think they would have taken it a little bit more serious because, uh, I mean, doesn't God have a track record with some of his, uh, uh, with the judges and with, and with the, uh, uh, the prophets? And, and when God, when it was saying that the, the day of the Lord is at hand, knowing that God's judgment is upon them, uh, you think they would have caught on by now, but unfortunately they have not. And so Zephaniah, uh, he basically repeated the same thing that Joel, the prophet Joel, was uh, was uh, preaching uh, and teaching it during his day. And that was the day of Jehovah is near. The day of the Lord is near. And so every time when you look at uh, that, that phrase, the day of the Lord, it really has to do with uh, um, a time of judgment was upon them. And that's really, I mean, uh, there was going to be a time of uh, of, of um pain. There's going to be a time of, a time of agony. Um, God's people were going to be uh, taken captive. And so Zephaniah's book, as I said, um, you know, I mean, it's, it, it has that one singular message. It's a very short book, uh, only a few chapters. Uh, and it's a simple message is that God's judgment's coming. Uh, Zephaniah's message uh, wasn't like Joel's in the sense that while they both taught the day of the, the day of the Lord is near, um, Joel taught that there was a locust plague that was going to come upon them, where uh, that's not what Zephaniah's messages uh, entailed. And so when you look at it, uh, Zephaniah's uh, singular message, as I keep saying, it's the day of the Lord. And when you look at that, the day of the Lord, it really had a three, uh, really three points that you could kind of look at in these, in these few chapters. Uh, it would be a day of wrath. Uh, it'd be a day of warning, and it would be a day of joy, wrath, warning, and joy. And so, you, so you look at that, um, and you and you ask, well, you know, how, how do we get from wrath and warning to joy? Well, because we know that there's going to be a remnant, and so we know that uh, after the seventy years of captivity uh, that Jeremiah uh, was prophesying about, and that Jeremiah was warning about, uh, that the, even though many would fall away, uh, and many would be caught up in the in, into the uh, and to the, the foreign gods uh, of the Babylonians and the Chaldeans, uh, we know that um, there was going to be a remnant who were going to remain faithful unto God. And so um, when we think about this time frame uh, during uh, Jehoiakim and, and Zedekiah, uh, the people of Judah uh, had become so wicked that God, he had to wipe them out. I mean, it just, he just couldn't, he couldn't put up with it anymore. He wasn't going to allow it to exist anymore. And so God sent, uh, sent them into Babylonian captivity, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And for 70 years before he wrote to them again, uh, with the message of joy uh, that that he wanted to write to them, uh, that the message that he wants to give them, uh, he has to he has to allow them to to suffer the seventy years of captivity. And so, I mean, you, if you think about God, you know, God always wants the best for His people. He always wants the best for His creation. We're His children. But at the end of the day, God's a righteous and holy God. And so God has to punish uh, evil. Uh, and so, you know, we look at uh, evil and pain and suffering today and people, you know, often ask, you know, if there's a holy and righteous God, why, why does he allow such things? And that's a great question because uh, 
uh, when you think about the scriptures and, and you look at uh, these prophets, right? Uh, as we get to Habakkuk, Habakkuk is going to answer that question. Why does God allow uh, evil, pain, and suffering? It's one of the uh, great philosoph philosophical questions of our day. Many of if you've ever taken a philosoph philosophical course uh, or a course in philosophy, that's one of the number one questions. Why does a holy and righteous God allow pain and suffering, uh, wrath and agony? And so um, we know that God sent the people of Israel uh, and Judah, Israel into Assyrian captivity, Judah into Babylonian captivity. And it wasn't because of God, um, uh, God turned his, his, his back on the people. These people ended up in the situation because of the sin in their lives. Um, they, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly what the law of God was. They knew exactly what God required of them. You remember, I told you back in Micah chapter six, you know, we looked at that and the question that Mike, Micah asks is that simple question, what does God require of us? I mentioned it in my sermon a couple of weeks ago. It, it would be it would behoove every single Christian in the 21st century to ask the same question that Micah presented in Micah chapter six. What does God require of us? So when you see that uh, that the, the Babylonians are uh, coming and, and just ravaging Jerusalem and the temple and and taking all the treasure and, and, and doing everything that they were doing and taking the people captive and many people died. It wasn't because of God. It was because of the wrath that was coming upon them because of their own sin. And so God always wants what's best for his creation. But sometimes in order to have what's best, you have to kind of wipe the slate clean. And so God always wants the gospel. He wants the good news to be known. But in order for uh, his message to be known, he has to have a people who want to hear it. And so we know that there was a remnant that was going to be in, uh, in Babylonian captivity that would refuse to bow the knee uh, to uh, pagan gods and that would remain faithful unto God. Uh, during that time. And it was, uh, you think about God, it's just as God wants his people in Judah, he wants them to repent. He doesn't want to have to, to, to do what he's doing and, and allow the Babylonians and use the Babylonians as a tool in order to kind of wipe the slate clean. God would love for his people to, re, uh, to repent, but that just wasn't the case. And God knows all things and he knows that that just isn't going to happen. And so, uh, as I said earlier, sometimes the rocks, if you think of like a farming analogy, right, you, you got to prepare the land, you got to prepare the ground, you got to remove the rocks from the soil, especially in that day and age and that time frame, right, where a lot of it was done by hand, uh, a lot of the old fashioned plowing, you know what I mean, with the, uh, with the animals and and so as they as they plowed the fields, they had to they had to prepare the ground. Right. Well, it's no different in a spiritual sense. You know, God had to you had to uh, prepare the hearts uh, of those uh, of that remnant that were going to um, last that 70 years that were going to return to Jerusalem. And so sometimes, as I said, uh, you know, God must come in judgment. God must wipe the slate clean in order to return uh, the blessings that he has in store for the people. And so in a similar sense, um, in a similar manner, think about God 650 years into the future will send John the Baptist. I mean, think about John the Baptist. What, what was his chief role, right? What was the chief role of the prophets to clear the path, to, clear, to make the crooked path straight, to kind of prepare the soil uh, for the seed, right? Well, it, while that's a physical uh, anal or analogy, we're thinking about it from a spiritual sense. We have to prepare the soil of our heart for the seed, the word of God. And so it, it's no different than what uh, Zephaniah is doing. It's no different than what uh, Jeremiah and, and, and many of the prophets have done. They're trying to prepare the way. And John the Baptist, 650 years into the future from, from this point, um, is going to clear the path for the Lord. And he's going to call the people unto repentance, no different than all the other prophets had done. And so all of God's prophets uh, performed very, uh, very similar uh, tasks. And so before we move on, what, what lessons can we learn from the message here in, in Zephaniah? You know, really the first, one of the first lessons that we get in the message from the book of Zephaniah is the fact that, as I said, the day of the Lord is coming. Uh, and if you do a study of that phrase, the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, it almost always refers to judgment. It just does. And so Zephaniah warned Judah of the doom that was coming. There was judgment coming. But it's not just on Judah. God's judgment was going to be coming 
on all the surrounding nations as well. For all nations were going to fall into God's judgment. And Zephaniah warned Judah of this, of their pending doom. The second really thing that we could look at during this message and the lesson that we can learn was there was a message of hope here. Whenever there was a message of warning and a message of wrath, there was generally a message of hope that if they turned back unto God, that God wouldn't do what he talked about in Deuteronomy when you have the covenant of blessings and cursing. So God sent the prophet to tell his people that they need to repent. In Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 7, the scriptures tell us, Be silent before the Lord your God, for the day of the Lord is near. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. And in general, you think about Zephaniah 1 and 7, the day of the Lord is understood as an occasion of God's intervention. When God interferes, or not interferes, intervenes in human affairs to judge the nations of man. And so especially those who are enemies of the Israelites and especially those who are um, those who are hostile towards God. And the whole point of this is to restore the faithful among the covenant people. That God, when he intervenes, he uses sometimes one group of, uh, of unrighteous people to take captive another group of unrighteous people, like you have seen throughout the time of judges, like you have seen throughout the time of the, uh, of the monarchy and the divided kingdom, that God would cause, um, cause pain and suffering to come upon them because of their sins, and many times would use one nation uh, in order to uh, punish another. And so, and we'll look more at that as we kind of talk about Habakkuk's uh, letter. Um, when you think about uh, Zephaniah, Zephaniah, he turns uh, the concept really against uh, uh, Judah uh, and, and Jerusalem um, by announcing that, that Yahweh's judgment comes uh, against Judah, who, who for the reason of, of embracing their pagan worship, uh, for, for embracing Baalism, and Baalism, we know, is just the, the worship of, of, of the God of Baal. And so he said that there would be a day of, of terror that was coming in, in verse 15 and 16 of chapter 1. And it would strike terror into everybody's heart from the king to the peasants uh, and, every, and everybody in between in, in, in the land of Judah. And so the day of Jehovah was coming as a judgment because God's people had fallen so deeply into sin uh, that it, it wasn't like um, what we often talk about in our Christian day about uh, like a moment of weakness. You know, I didn't have a moment of weakness and sin, you know, and then so God's going to cause, you know, tragedy or or. or, 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 or uh, another nation to come and, and take me captive. That's not what we're talking about here. This is is, is this is like deep rooted sin, sin that has become a way of life, and that you can't even look to any other thing uh, without considering uh, the worship of these uh, of these pagan gods, because the worship of these pagan gods many times. Uh, had to deal with the fleshly desires of man. It had to deal with the emotional and fleshly desires of man, and so it it the 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 worship was more beneficial from that standpoint than it was to worship God, and so many of them would constantly fall away, and it was just just deeply ingrained in them. Uh, after many of the kings, uh, both of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, allowed just widespread idolatry and immorality amongst the people, and so so as you look at this, uh, we know that that there is a judgment that's coming. We know that it's going to be on all of God's creation. We know that it's going to be on man. It's going to be on beasts. It's going to be on Hebrews. It's going to be on Gentiles. The day of the Lord is coming. The judgment is coming. And so the message of hope was that uh, is that after this comes, there is going to be a remnant uh, that would want, once again resurface. And that remnant, uh, kind of if you think about it during the time of, uh, of Elijah, when Elijah thought he was the last one. And, you know, he's crying unto the Lord, complaining unto the Lord, Lord, you know, save me. I, I'm the only one. And the Lord came to him and basically told him, he says, relax, you're not the only one. You're not the last one. You're not the only one. There's 750 individuals who have found, uh, not found the need to bow the knee to, uh, to Baal. And so we know that this remnant, uh, uh, Zephaniah talks about it in chapter three and verse 12 and 13. Notice what it says. Zephaniah chapter three and verse 12 and 13 says this, but I will leave you among, but I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. And then I think of verse 20, um, of how the, the, the book of F, uh, Zephaniah ends in verse 20 of chapter 3, and it says, At that time I will bring you in, 
Even at that time when I gather you together, indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before the eyes, says the Lord. You look at verse 20 there. And essentially, verse 20 closes with the promise of bringing the faithful, with bringing the humble, the faithful, humble remnant back home. Where's back home? Back to Jerusalem. To do what? To build to build up Jerusalem again, to restore the walls, to re restore the temple. And so restoring their fortunes, in, in a sense, uh, it, it's, it speaks of a spiritual sense, right? Uh, it speaks of restoring their salvation. It, re it speaks of restoring their relationship with God uh, that had been so, um, so just terribly um, uh, divided uh, because of the people fell so far away from God. And so when we think about the restoration uh, here in verse 20, it's, it's less to do with physical uh, restoration and more to do with a spiritual restoration. The people of Israel and Judah found themselves in captivity, as I said, because of their own unfaithfulness, because of their idolatry, because of their immorality. It wasn't because of God's unfaithfulness. Similarly, think about it in the 21st century. Think about it in the Christian era, the, the era of the church. If someone in the Christian era finds themselves in hell after they stand before God in judgment, as I often say, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, we will stand before God and give an account of our lives, whether good or bad. We will give an account of our lives. If somebody finds themselves in hell after judgment, it's not because God's an unfaithful God. It's not because God uh, turned his back on you. It's because you turned your back on God. It's because you did not do what you were called to do. It's because you rejected the Christian doctrine. It's because you rejected Jesus Christ and his law and his new covenant. And so we must do all we can to warn our family and friends and all who will hear uh, the word of God that the day of the Lord is still coming. And so the day of the Lord uh, had to do with uh, warning and wrath uh, during the time of Zephaniah, during the time of Jeremiah and all the prophets, it's no different than today. We are God's representatives that go out into the world. And what do we do? We, we warn the world. We warn our friends and family of what? Of pending doom a pending disaster if they don't get their act together if they don't turn to god if they don't repent of the sin in their lives and so brethren the christian era uh is is really no different than the era that we that we're reading about here uh during about 625 bc um and so we have to really consider that uh, as close as when we think about the day of the Lord is near, it's as close as our is our untimely death, right? I mean, we don't know when we're going to die. We know that the second coming uh, of Christ is going to come like a thief in the night where no one knows a day or time or else we, we, we would be prepared. But we know that because he's coming like a thief in the night, we need to be ready. We need to make sure our friends and family are ready. And at the end of the day, we don't know when our last breath is going to happen. Uh, there are many people who die daily, uh, and, and when they take their last breath and their spirit returns unto the Father, they will stand before God in judgment. And so the day of the Lord is as near as really as our, as our next breath or our last breath. And now we move on to the next prophet, and that's Nahum. And so Nahum was another prophet. Uh, during this period, um, Jeremiah and I said uh, Zephaniah, they both uh, they both preached and they both uh, brought their messages about 625 BC. And now we have Nahum, which is about 614 BC. Um, and he also prophesied during this time frame. And then after this, we'll look at Habakkuk. Um, and this was about two years before the fall of Nineveh. And this kind of takes a little bit of a different turn in a sense that um, when we think of the fall of Nineveh, and it was two years before that, um, who was the prophet that was sent to Nineveh? Do we remember? We spoke of him uh, many weeks ago. And so it was Jonah. And Jonah was the prophet that, would, that was sent to Nineveh, and he wanted Nineveh destroyed. He wanted to see their destruction. How happy would Jonah be if he was still alive? Uh, during the during the preaching of the book uh, or during the preaching or the prophesying of Nahum, because Nahum came to to uh, to talk about the destruction of Nineveh, and so Jonah he would have probably have loved to have been around during this day, because the Ninevites that had once uh, repented, had turned away from their repentance and fallen back into judgment. They had fallen back into disfavor by going and doing, continuing to live in worldliness. And so it was over a hundred years later. I mean, think about it. From the time when the, the, when the book of Nahum uh, was written, when the time of this judgment was going to come upon the people of, the, of Nineveh, this was a hundred years after Jonah, right? So Jonah's long gone, uh, and he's never going to see this uh, to come to fruition. 
question. And because you have to understand that the Ninevites were enemies uh, of, of the Israelites and, and there was no love lost between the two. And so the book of Nahum has, has a, a very simple three point outline. When you look at the book of Nahum, we know that the, the, the three points that we can, look, we can look at is God is the judge. The verdict was, <coughs> excuse me, God is the judge. The verdict is in and they were guilty. And so in that there would be an execution, uh, which would be the death and the, the destruction of the Ninevites. So there's the judge, there's the verdict, and the, and, and, uh, and the verdict is they're found guilty, and that there's now the execution of the verdict, right, uh, of the judgment. And so Nahum, in a sense, you could kind of look at it as, as a scene in a courtroom, if you will, right? And so the judge, the verdict, the execution. The book can uh, essentially be summed up in, in the simple phrase that Nineveh, and if I was going to be doomed, right? They're going to be doomed because God had had spared them a hundred years earlier when the prophet Jonah was sent by God in order to get the people to repent. And if they would have stayed in repentance, then God would they would have stayed in God's favor. And yet that's not what happens. A hundred years later, they're back to doing the very things that God had sent Jonah to warn them about in the beginning. And so this is the message of Nahum. It's a very simple message. And uh, even even shortly after Nineveh had repented during Jonah's day, they had become uh, uh, so wicked again as a nation. Uh, there's not a whole lot of difference between really um, uh, Nahum and his preaching to uh, Nineveh. Uh, and then the message that you see from Jeremiah and the message that you see from uh, Zephaniah in regards to, uh, to Judah. And so we look at this, that God's people would, would constantly be uh, in and out, in and out in regards to uh, fellowship with God, in regards to living according to God's command, living according to God's word. And so when they weren't living according to God's word, he allowed them to be taken captive. Well, uh, so we see that Nineveh is going to fall into God's judgment. And we look at what lessons can we learn from this very short letter. And essentially, there was basically two messages. Number one, uh, was God, uh, was God is the ultimate judge. He's not the judge of just the Jews. He's not just the judge of the Hebrews or the Israelites, like we often talk about. No, he's the God of all creation. And so, yes, he is going to judge the, 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 uh, the Ninevites and Nineveh in the same way that he judges, uh, uh, Israel and how they were taken captive. And they were basically never to, to, to come upon the scene again. And then you have the, the Southern kingdom of Judah, who is now taken into Babylonian captivity and they're going to be in captivity for 70 years years. And so, brethren, when you look at this information, uh, Nahum talked about God as being the judge. He just, when, when Nahum, in, in his short letter, when he describes God, uh, he describes God as a jealous God, as a vengeful God, as a furious God, as a wrathful God. And so too often, we always want to consider the love of God, the grace and the mercy of God, and, and rightfully so. But we have to understand there's another side to God. And God was a jealous God. He was a vengeful, wrathful God. Uh, and he was furious with uh, the, just the outright uh, disobedience from his creation. And so um, we know that... Uh, that, uh, that Nahum said that God is great in power and that he would not acquit, he would not acquit the wicked, right? Meaning that he would not uh, look past the, the wickedness like Eli looked past the wickedness. Remember the, uh, the high priest Eli? Uh, he often looked past the wickedness of his sons and that brought about, that brought about his untimely death. And so we know, brethren, that, that God is not just a judge uh, of mankind. He's also our father. Uh, he was the judge uh, to the wicked in Nineveh, but he was also the father to the righteous. And so as a father, he came and he warned his children a hundred years earlier during the preaching of Jonah. And if they would have stayed uh, in, in, in continued on in the ways of the Lord, then guess what? They would, have found, they would have been found pleasing in the sight of God. And yet that's not what happens. And so a loving father has to punish uh, wickedness of his children. And so when Nahum talked about God as the father, he, he gave a good description of what a father uh, looks like. A father is slow to anger. Uh, 
Can you say that God was slow to anger? There's a hundred years that passed between the preaching of Jonah and the preaching of Nahum. And so, yes, he was slow to anger. Uh, he was a, he was a loving God. He was a good God. Uh, he was a stronghold. God, the Father, is a stronghold in our day of trouble, meaning that we could call upon the name of the Lord, meaning that we could trust God. And he knows, um, and, and, and all who are righteous know that we could trust in the Lord. We could trust in his promises. The second message, and uh, before we move on to Habakkuk, the second message from Nahum was about uh, was about the wicked. Uh, Nahum said that they had uh, they were condemned to destruction. Uh, we see that in chapter one. Uh, he said that there would be utterly they would be utterly and totally blotted out. Um, uh, so we see that also in chapter one. And he said that God uh, would dig their graves. He said that their great wealth and their great power would not be able to save them from the judgment as we get to chapter three of that letter. And so even though so many of people of mankind uh, want to focus in on great wealth and great power, that great wealth and power will not be able to save them in Nineveh, and it will not be able to save us. I mean, think about right now with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, why, why is there the need for Russia to go in there? Because of they want, this is a great power who wants more wealth. It's all about power and wealth. And yet that power and wealth will not be able to save them in the judgment. And that power and wealth will not be able to save anybody in the judgment. You see, brethren, when we die, our, our spirits are going to return back unto the Father, whether you're a child of God or not, because we are all God's creation. In the beginning, God created. If you go back to Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created, and we are his creation, and all of us will stand before God in judgment. And it doesn't matter how much power or wealth you accumulate, none of that will help you uh, if you live contrary to the message and contrary to the law of God. And so that's essentially the, the, the message that we see uh, as we uh, look at uh, Nahum. And now we get to the fourth and final prophet of this time frame. So, so far we have looked at Jeremiah, we've looked at Zephaniah, we've looked at Nahum, and now we're going to look at Habakkuk. And Habakkuk was the, the last prophet uh, during, this, uh, during this time period, if you will. Uh, he prophesied somewhere between uh, somewhere between the years 612 BC and 606 BC, uh, because uh, Chaldea had risen to the power. And when we say Chaldea, uh, we're talking about Babylon. Uh, so Chaldea, Babylon, they were they were really recognized as a great power uh, in the year 612 BC. Uh, Habakkuk was um, he was kind of a complainer. You think about the prophet of God, he was a complainer and he was a doubter uh, at times, uh, not doubting God, but just doubting um I guess, why God's punishment hasn't come sooner. And so when, when we think about Habakkuk, we think about his doubts and his complaints. God does not judge uh, complaining, right? Uh, he doesn't judge doubting as long as they are expressed directly towards him. OK, meaning that if we go to God in prayer, if we petition God and we go to him with a heavy heart and we talk to him about what's on our heart. And if we have complaints, if we have doubts, uh, then God will respond. Right. And we know that he responds today in scripture. We have all the answers to our questions. And yet we know that uh, that God, he, uh, he deals directly with his prophets uh, through through his word and through uh, through visions. And so when we think about we think about God as the ultimate judge, right? Uh, he's not going to rebuke him for complaining and doubting because he did it directly to him. Now, if we doubt and complain against a God to everybody else, then the fury of God is going to come upon us. That 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 is that is clear and evident from what we see in Scripture, right? When you you go back to the times of Aaron and his uh, or uh, or Moses and his brother Aaron and his sister, right, uh, Miriam, when when they complained. And, and, and they murmured, right? And, and they doubted um, who, who was the one that came and, and rebuked them for that, right? Uh, they rebuked, uh, they, re, uh, they, he, they were rebuked for having the audacity to challenge God's man, right? And so we see something similar here. Um, so uh, do not complain or express doubt to anyone uh, when it comes to our relationship with God or what God is doing. Take all of the complaints that we have to God and to God alone. 
Uh, we know that God is big enough. We know that he's strong enough. We know that he's righteous enough uh, to, to, to deal with our complaints, to deal with our doubts, and to deal with us honestly and righteously. Uh, we know that God will teach us with a lesson uh, that oftentimes is considered strict. You, you, you look at all of the lessons that God had brought upon his people uh, because they entered into a covenant relationship with God. They willfully entered into this covenant relationship. And so God, when you look at all the judgments and the punishments that he brought upon the people of Israel during the, their 15, 1600 years of existence as God's people, we know that many people would say it was, it was uh, maybe strict or was it over the top? And the answer would be no, that God is a holy and righteous judge. And these people brought upon the, their own pain and suffering, they brought it upon themselves. And so that was what Habakkuk needed to learn. Um, we know that the book of Habakkuk essentially has two parts. Uh, there's the problem in chapters one and two, and then there's the praise in chapter three. There's two parts. It's a very simple message. Um, the problem for Habakkuk was when he looked around and he saw all the wickedness, he saw the idolatry, he saw all the sin in Judah. Uh, so he went to God and he complains to God because of Judah. Why do I have to essentially go to this people uh, who will not uh, respect you, who will not hear your word, and who will not heed the message that I bring to them? And so he's complaining to God about all of this wickedness, and idolatry. And Habakkuk said, God, how can you allow this? Why do you not come in judgment? How can you sit there and allow your people to be so wicked? How can you be righteous and yet allow wickedness? Did you hear that last part? How can you be righteous and allow wickedness? Don't we ask a very similar question today? Don't people ask a similar question today? Uh, and that question is simply that, uh, you know, how does God allow all the evil, pain, and suffering that we see in the world? God answers Habakkuk. Uh, because God answers honest doubt. And it, this was his prophet. This was a man who was an honest, righteous man and who had honest doubts about what was taking place, why God had not come upon them sooner. Jeremiah was also, if you read his letter, was also an honest doubter, if you will. He had the same problem. Why is God so slow, they would ask Jeremiah and Habakkuk, why is God so slow in bringing judgment upon the wicked? Brethren, I'm telling you that if you were to take a, a philosophy class, this is one of the most, this is one of the number one philosophical questions that, that are asked. And, and it's not just in our age, it's in all ages. If there's a holy and righteous God and a loving God, why does he allow all this pain and suffering and evil that we see in the world? And so why, why do we see that the, the suffering of the righteous and yet we see that the wicked seem to be uh, prospered? right? Those who are living worldly lives are seeming to prosper, and yet those who are living righteous lives are, are dealing with all types of pain and suffering, and people just can't wrap their minds around that. And so if you were to take, uh, like I said, this philosophy class, I guarantee you it would be one of the first questions. It would be one of the number one questions, not just here in America, but around the world and in every generation. We know that Jeremiah and Habakkuk had the same question. God, how can you let wickedness go unpunished? And here's the answer. In essence, God's answer is this. He says, I'm not. I am raising up right now the bitter and the nasty nation of Chaldea, meaning Babylon. And they're going to come and they're going to, to, going to bring judgment upon Judah. So, Lord, how can you allow this to happen? And yet the Lord says, I'm not. For at this very time, you don't know my ways, you don't know my plans, but at this very time, I am bringing up Babylon to, to raise them up, to bring them against who? To bring them in judgment against Judah. And so Habakkuk thought that he had an even bigger problem then. Because Habakkuk said, how can God take this wicked nation, take this horribly wicked nation, and destroy a, a nation that is wicked, but it's less wicked? So in his mind, he still doesn't get it. He's like, God, I still don't get it. He's like, you're punishing this nation who is not as wicked as the other nation, and yet there's a difference. You see, it was the people of Israel, the people of Judah, who entered into a covenant relationship with God. They were the ones who promised to live according to, God, to God's law and God's command. And so God now is using Babylon to then do what? To judge the people, to condemn the people of Judah. And yet there will still be a remnant that will come through this. And so how can God use such dirty tools, such dirty instruments? That's the question that Habakkuk has. And God's answer was very simple. He says, I want you to, he tells him in the letter, he says, I want you to hide and I want you to watch. 
get up on this high place and I want you to watch and see what I will do. And maybe then, just maybe you will understand it. And so sometimes God's answer to doubt is you need to trust me. You need to trust me. You need to just wait. Have I not done well in the past? Have I not brought judgment upon the world in the past? But we also know that, that God desire isn't for us to perish. God's desire isn't for our death. God's desire is for us to repent. He doesn't desire that any of his children, any of his creation should perish. And so God is patient towards us. And so God tells us, he says, you should trust me and you need to wait. Have I not done what is righteous and right in the past? I will also do the same today and I will do so in the future. And sometimes God's people just have to have faith to hide, to watch, and to see exactly what God will do. And as soon as Habakkuk was told to wait and watch in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 1 through 19, you look at the end of this, right? Habakkuk basically said this. He says, and I'm going to summarize the chapter, uh, chapter 3. Uh, you know, it says, praise the Lord. I now have the answer. The answer is I do not have to take care of it. It's not my circus. It's not my monkeys. You ever hear that analogy? And so he, he knows that the answer is I don't have to take care of it. I just simply have to do what God asks me to do. I bring a message and the message is a one of repentance. The answer is God is going to take care of it. I'm going to sit up here on this high place and I'm going to watch and God will give me hinds feet and I may walk upon my high places. I will praise the Lord. Even if I lose all sustenance of life, I will still praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, Habakkuk's prayer for God's mercy. He prayed for God's mercy. He was reminded of God's mercy and he trusted in God's mercy. Habakkuk is really a great book and it has a couple great lessons for us. Number one is the lesson of the universal supremacy of God. Is God not uh, universally supreme? Is he not all sovereign? And we know, and we think about God's universal supremacy, God's judgment is always going to come upon the wicked in a manner and a time of his choosing. And so rather than man trying to solve all the problems of the world and trying to make the world into this righteous, better place, we need to trust that God knows what needs to be done because God is the righteous judge. You know what the problem with mankind is? We like to judge. We're kind of judgy. Let's just be honest. And so mankind likes to judge and likes to ask the question, you know, why, when is the wrath going to come upon such and such individual and such and such uh, for such and such uh, transgressions? And yet God's answer to Habakkuk was to stand here, hide here and wait and watch and trust. You see, brethren, when we think about the universal supremacy of God, we need to understand that rather than man trying to solve all of the problems and trying to make everything right in the world, we need to allow God to be what who God is. And that is the creator that is all powerful. That is the righteous judge. God says, let me be God. And you just do what I ask you to do. Do not question my work on earth. I will punish the wicked and I may use the wicked to punish one another. I may use tornadoes. I may use earthquakes to do it. I will do it in a way, and I want, I'll do it in a way in a time of my choosing because I am supreme. I am sovereign. I am the judge. You must quit being the judge. You see, brethren, if we quit being the judge and we allow God to judge, man, would our lives be so much simpler. You see, I wouldn't have to worry about all the injustices of the world. I would simply have to just worry about finding myself living the type of life that's pleasing before God and righteousness. And so brethren, before we, you know, close this lesson down, most complexities of life are solved when people uh, let God be in control. If we let go of the wheel, you know, that, that song, you know, uh, Jesus take the wheel. Most of the problems of life, most of the complexities of life can be solved if we allow God to take the wheel. Meaning if we're willing to be obedient if we're willing to submit ourselves to a holy and righteous God, who is the ultimate judge, who will have all things that will either be punished or, uh, or brought uh, or prospered in a time and a place of his choosing. You see, God's blessings will come upon his people uh, when he sends them. But it's not up to you to judge when God should send them. It's not up to you to judge when a people should be punished or not punished. You see, the controversies between men, particularly uh, if you think about the church, you think about the kingdom of God, the Lord's church, the controversies amongst us would be solved if people would just get over the natural tendency to try to be the judge of everybody. 
We're constantly trying to judge anything and everything. Let God be the judge. His judgment is universal. His judgment is supreme. His judgment is sovereign. And the second and the final lesson before we close this lesson down that we learned from Habakkuk is that faithfulness is the guarantee of permanence. Faithfulness is the guarantee of permanence. What do we mean by that? This lesson is very important for today's world because the verse in Habakkuk chapter two and verse four says, but the righteous will live by faith, but the righteous will live by his faith. Habakkuk two and four is that same verse is quoted twice in the, in the new Testament. Once we see it in revelation chapter one and verse 17, we also see it in the book of Galatians in chapter three and verse 11. And when you think about that, we know that the righteous shall live by faith. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God. Well, what is biblical faith? Remember, I say it all the time. It's, it's, it's threefold. It's trust, it's belief, and it's obedience. Trust, belief, obedience. You can't have biblical faith. You can't have a, a righteous faith if you don't have a, a trust, if you don't believe, and if you're not obedient, meaning willing to submit to the word of God. You see, brethren, the word live does not mean that... That they, that they shall work by or make progress by. It says the righteous will live by his faith. It means that the righteous will stand and they will be righteous in the time, uh, uh, in times of, uh, of trouble, in times of, of, of discord. We need to understand that it means that the righteous are going to stand and they will continue to be established by the Lord if we allow God to be the judge. What establishes the people of God? Uh, what are they saved by? What do they stand by? What do they walk and live by? The answer to those questions is faith. We are saved by faith. We stand by faith. We walk and we live by faith and we die by faith. You see, brethren, it's a very simple, uh, very simple formula if you're willing to submit to the will of God. So what will God's people have throughout all eternity? We know in 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, it says now uh, uh, these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is the greatest. But later on, throughout all of eternity, God's people will have to have faith in God. God's people are going to have to trust and believe. God's people are going to have to stop being so judgy and allow God to be the righteous and holy judge. We simply only have to do what he asks us to do. The prophets didn't have to do anything more or anything less than what God had asked them to do. He would send them to a particular place, to a particular people with a particular message. No more, no less. God has sent us, his children, uh, disciples of Christ, into the world to bring a message to the world. And that message is that the day of the Lord is near, brethren. And we need to take that message out by faith and understand that there's a, it's a message of hope. Because understanding that Jesus Christ has already overcome the world. Jesus Christ has already defeated death, and it's in Christ Jesus that we have uh, that we have reconciliation to God. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that hope and faith and love; these are the things that faith is made of. Not the ability, not our, not on, it's not our faith isn't based on our, our on our own abilities, on our own numbers, on our own knowledge. But our faith is what will guarantee all of God's people a permanent place if they are willing to submit unto the message of God and to the will of God. So brethren, we're going to close it down. That's the book of Habakkuk in a nutshell. Uh, and so we've looked at here these last couple of weeks, Jeremiah, uh, Nahum, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. And now we're, we'll, after this, we'll continue on with this kind of high-level overview until we get back to the uh, building, hopefully here in a few, uh, few Wednesdays. And then uh, we might go in a different direction uh, from, the, from the Old Testament and get, jump back into the New Testament. So uh, it's been a good study. And we'll continue this next week, but let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you so much for all your blessings. Father, we know uh, how, how blessed we are, and we are just so thankful for your answered prayers. You're thankful for your providence in our lives. And I just pray, Father God, for uh, your message uh, to be on our hearts and our minds, and that we take the message out into the world. I pray that you give us the courage when we are weak and afraid, uh, that we could take it out and not have to worry about being judged, but just have to worry about being obedient to you and submitting to you and to taking the message out to any and all people in all places and be willing to do so. 
uh, with, uh, with the spirit of love and compassion and kindness. I pray, Father God, that, uh, that the leaders of this world could come to the knowledge of the truth of your word. There's so much pain and suffering in this world because of worldliness, because of worldly people who do not know uh, how to live according to your ways and your standard. And I pray that you use us, Father, as tools to take your message out into society. I pray, Father God, that you'll put somebody in the path of each of us, Father, that we could mentor them and that we could teach them and that we could raise them up according to your word. And I just pray, Father God, that that word will prick their hearts and that they'll be one, they'll want to become disciples of Christ. And I just pray, Father God, uh, blessings on us as we do that work. Father, we pray for the situation in Ukraine. We pray for all of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and in Russia. Uh, we pray that uh, cooler heads will prevail. We pray that there will be no loss of life. We pray, Father God, that there will be no war. Father, we know that uh, there is a way that seems right unto the men. And in, in the end, it leads to death, both physically and spiritually, oftentimes. And so, Father, I just pray that your truth, your message of love and hope for the world can go out through all the saints. And I pray that we could uh, just be such an influence on society that people will want to turn away from the sin and repent and turn to you. Father God, once again, we thank you. And we love you. And we ask you to thank you for all these things in Christ Jesus name. Amen. God bless, brethren. And we'll talk with you soon.